this conference organized by the College of Humanities and Social Sciences is born out of the historicizing the humanities at Makere University project that is sponsored by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. The project focuses on rethinking um, the humanities and humanistic scholarship and knowledge production from my Ugandan locus. This conference therefore is intended to create a forum for researchers and leading professionals to discuss and critically reflect on the role and the significance of the humanities and the social sciences in shaping um, present and future trends in Uganda and beyond. This conference covers topics in the humanities and social sciences and has welcomed researchers and practice, practitioners from universities in Uganda, from research institutions, and from the civil society to grapple and interrogate uh, how the humanities and humanistic social sciences, uh, their theories, their historical trends, and the methodological innovations involved therein allow us to meaningfully reflect and dissect crucial existential challenges of our time. We received 122 abstracts and eight panel proposals, all of which went through a rigorous process uh, uh, in terms of reviewing. And therefore, we want to thank all our dear participants who have responded to our call when it went out, and also who have continued to be interested in this conference, even after it was changed in format, because initially we had wanted to have a blended conference, but because of the uh, situation of the pandemic, we have been forced to uh, uh, change the format to a batch one. But you, dear our participants, you have been uh, uh, very patient with us and still showed interest in joining us to uh, uh, undertake this year's conference. So we are very, very grateful for that. We also want to thank our keynote speakers, Professor Paul Chiambe Zeleza, the Vice Chancellor of the United States International University uh, in Nairobi, and Professor Monica Chibita, the Dean of the Faculty of Journalism and Communication at the Uganda Christian University in Kono, who have uh, allowed to uh, give the keynote addresses for this conference this year. We are very grateful to them. We also want in a very special way to thank our panel of experts who will be engaging in a conversation with the academia to share experiences and insights that can enrich the scholarship in the humanities. We are very grateful to our panel of experts. We are also grateful to the organizing committee that has enabled us and the college to organize this event and to ensure even in these very unprecedented times that the conference uh, still runs. Uh, we hope that through the deliberations over these three days, we will accentuate our contribution to the collective response that the world needs to impact lives and societies that are threatened by the challenges of the new era. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you once again to this conference and I wish you very wonderful deliberations over the three days. Thank you very much. Yes, that has been our very own Dr. Aisha Nachwala, the chair organizing committee. Once the chair organizing committee has addressed us, I imagine that all of us, the participants, presenters, and everyone following, we now understand 
the theme for the humanities and humanistic social sciences scholarship for a new era. This is the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And we are blessed to have our very own, that is the principal of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Associate Professor Josephine Ahikile. We welcome the principal in a very special way. And we thank the principal for being always there to support the organizing committee for this conference. And let us all tune in. Let us all welcome the principal and listen to the principal. You're welcome, our principal. Good afternoon, everyone. I standing here on the soil of Makere University and addressing all of you online uh, in the different parts of Uganda, in the different parts of the world. You're welcome to the National Humanities Conference 2021. Our dear guest of honor, the chairperson, Makerere University Council, Mrs. Lona Magara. Our keynote speakers, Professor Tiambe Zereza, the vice chancellor of the United States University, Nairobi, and Professor Monica Chibita, the dean, faculty of journalism at the Uganda Christian University. The Vice Chancellor, Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, Professor Umar Kakumba, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Finance and Administration, Professor Josephine Nabukenya, our Deputy Principal, Professor Julius Chikoma, deans and directors, the heads of departments, members of staff, Makere University, our dear students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you to 2021 Humanities Conference of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. We call it CHOOSE. I sincerely thank all of you dignitaries who have graced our occasion, our conference. Our keynote speakers, Professor Paul Tiambe Zereza and Professor Monica Chibita. Thank you for this vote of confidence in Makere University and in CHOOSE as top scholars on the continent and globally, you are much treasured by Makere University. You are a shining light to a young Africa. Professor Tiambe Zereza, top-notch historian on the African continent, the young African scholars are looking up to you. Our dear own, Professor Monica Chivita, our young journalists and journalism scholars are looking up to you. So we are really honored that you were able to spare this time to be with us at Makere University at this conference that is exciting all of us. I sincerely appreciate the chairperson, Makere University Council, for the leadership, the stewardship of the university. Our vice chancellor, the deputy vice chancellors, director, uh, directorate of research and graduate training, 
we thank you for the strong support to the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. We don't, we don't take this for granted. We know that with this environment, we are able to expand our horizon as a college. CHOOSE is proud to be holding this year's National Humanities Conference entitled Humanities and Humanistic Social Sciences Scholarship for a New Era. The historical role of the humanities in bolstering the multifarious facets of development is expansive. And in many regards, it's self-evident. Humanities has been very critical in the study of people and society, and in explaining and ultimately celebrating societal commonalities and differences. They have been at the forefront of fostering critical thought about life, its afflictions and ideals of human society. This conference aims at providing the space where the scholars can freely debate and rejuvenate conversations central to human existence. We are also glad to say that this conference is part of the celebration of Makere's 100 years of existence. We could say this is an early bird event. Uh, as choose, we have said to Simbude, we have started the journey. Makere University has been in existence since 1922. Next year will be the climax of the 100 year celebration. And we are part of that journey. The humanities have been at the heart of Makere University since its birth in 1922. The university is reputed for eminent scholars, post-independent political leaders, and activists. Some of them, Benjamin Mkapa, Ngugi Wathiongo, Julius Nyerere Mwarimo, and others. Under the ambit of the CHOOSE program dubbed Humanities at Mark 100, this conference is part of the efforts to galvanize humanities scholarship for even greater human utility here on the African continent. As humanity continues to grapple with challenges such as climate change, terrorism, mass migration, pandemics, extreme want, injustices, and lack of social cohesion, there is clearly a need for more ingenuity and inventiveness, and that will come from the humanities. In very specific ways, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the need for a multidisciplinary approach to this unprecedented global health challenge with the human subject at the center. Of course, due to this very pandemic, this conference is virtual. We therefore miss out on the physical interaction, the physical presence and the enriching academic uh, exchange that would have accompanied that physical presence. However, we also take the opportunity to beat the odds and utilize the technological advancement and still hold this conference. The option would have been to postpone it as the chair of the scientific committee has indicated. But we said, let's have this conference and let's demonstrate human resilience in terms of addressing our challenges that face it. So in this case, this conference is an opportunity for us to explore more, uh, more avenues for resilience, especially also in our teaching and learning. And in this, I would like to take this opportunity 
to thank the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning, IODEL, at the College of Education and External Studies at Makere University for supporting this conference because we are able now to hold a fully virtual conference, which we did not anticipate. Thank you, IODEL, uh, the, the entire team led by Dr. Godfrey Mayende. This determination to hold the conference even amidst the turbulent waters and tides of the pandemic shows our commitment to humanities and social sciences scholarship. Most of all, it shows that our resilience is not in vain. We shall indeed overcome as humanity, both as academia and humanity at large. At this conference, we are also unveiling a twin volume of the Mawazo Journal. It's the, Mawajo, Ma, the Journal of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. The college is vigorously encouraging publication and peer mentoring, and I encourage all staff to embrace this opportunity to publish and expand our knowledge horizons. This volume showcases research by both staff and students and the variety of top-notch scholarship within the college. It goes a long way in enhancing the university vision of a research-led university. So as a college, we are proud to be part of the building blocks of a research-led university. I would like to thank the chair of the scientific committee, Dr. Aisha Nachwara, who has steered the committee. Uh, I ordinarily would have loved the members to stand up. So those online and the few in the room, you can symbolically stand up for recognition. That is a symbolically standing up uh, because these are very few compared to the, to the expanse um, effort of the committee. They are very members uh, who are online. I also thank the convener or uh, Dr. Levis Mugumia who has demonstrated that unique style of attention to detail. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Levis Mugumia. Uh, I acknowledge the efforts by the deputy principal, uh, Professor Julius Chikoma, for steering uh, some of the uh, processes of the committee. All the members, thank you very much. So as according to the book of abstracts that we have, we are going to have 124 paper presentations and six panel presentations. And majority of these are by graduate students, members of staff, senior, early career, and so on. Others are from sister universities, um, Kabare University, Chambogo, Gulu University, and so on. And some are also from outside the country uh, on, in universities across the continent. The panels also include pra uh, practitioners in the public world, such as from the women's movement, NGOs, and cultural institutions. And one thing to celebrate also is that majority of the members of the organizing committee and the scientific committee are largely early career scholars. And for us as a college, this is gratifying that young scholars are actually in charge and they are able to direct uh, academic and, and the research agenda at CHOOSE. So a huge thank you to the entire college leadership, the deans and the heads of departments for enabling this huge momentum in academic vibrancy. On behalf of the college, I take this opportunity once again to thank management of Makere University for facilitating us to always seek to expand our horizon. I also appreciate our key partners, in this case, the Andrew Mellon Foundation in the USA, 
and the Gilda Henko Stiftung in Germany for allowing to dream with us and humanity at large. Briefly to say that the current initiatives at the college, we have uh, research projects around historicizing the humanities. We have early career programs. We have PhD cohort training. And we have the Center of Excellence in Research, Teaching and Learning, which is exploring innovative ways of teaching and, and, and researching humanities and social sciences in a new era. We also have the archiving memory and method, uh, a project that is particularly exciting in that it will engage research and document and recenter archiving as a method and, and, and revalidate indigenous knowledge uh, that is important um, to our identity construction and existence. I have already said, you know, I'm an African. So this morning when I woke up, I said, yes, I've been communicating with the Professor Tiambe online, but I feel there's something not right. So I went to the website, picked his number and called and said, you know, Prof, I know we met in Cordesria and so on, but I want to hear your voice. I want to feel and touch because as an African, I want to know that we are meeting at two. I don't trust this virtual space. And, and somehow uh, it, it sort of relieved me in terms of, yes, we are in charge and we are able to, you know, celebrate some of our Africanness. Um, I've already talked about the Gilda Henko Foundation that is funding PhD training and, and research scholarship. Some of these have graduated. We had the bumper harvest in May, and there is an opportunity for us to, to, to really enhance our capacity in research and, and teaching. We also particularly like to thank the government of Uganda for investing in research and investing in Makere University. As of now, we have over 60 funded uh, research projects under the Makere Research and Innovation Fund. These projects have really rejuvenated the academic uh, vibrancy of uh, the members of staff. There is collaboration, there is more uh, publication, there's more positive energy to build for the future uh, in terms of research and innovation. It has given us a great opportunity as a, a college to demonstrate the utility of humanities and social sciences in the wider academy. This research has indeed shown that there is need to invest more in local research and innovation. The VC and your entire management, we thank you for the support and for creating that enabling environment to keep the fire burning at Mark, uh, to energize the colleges and to energize us, to be able to create spaces like these ones, like this conference. Because of this energy, our mantra, choose on the move is very much alive. We are indeed on the move as we extend the horizons of academic scholarship and we still keep on the move. I welcome all of you to this National Humanities Conference. May this be a chance for us to rethink our nature of scholarship, especially as scholars and actors on the African continent May our innovations live to testify that we actually engaged in building for the future. And I thank you for all the resilience and the fact that you're able to beat the odds and put the conference effort together. I thank you all as we build for the future.
May I take this opportunity to invite the Vice Chancellor, Makere University, Professor Banabas Nawangwe. Professor Banabas Nawangwe, you're welcome to the National Humanities Conference 2021. We know that you, you would have loved to be physically here, but as they say, you're very much always in spirit in supporting academic endeavors of the members of staff. You're very welcome, Professor Banabas Nawangwe. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hikire. I am very much with you. I'm just trying to practice the new normal and make sure that we all get used to it. And so I would like to recognize the chairperson of council, Mrs. Lona Magara, who is our guest of honor, our keynote speakers, the deputy vice chancellors, principals, and members of management, staff and students, all participants, ladies and gentlemen. The origin of universities is in the humanities, having started in monasteries with the philosophy as the main subject. Of course, universities have transformed tremendously, but no university is really a university without the humanities. And that's why we have some very prominent higher education institutions still called institutes because they lack the humanities. The history of Makere is deeply rooted in the humanities, which have contributed greatly to Makere's contribution to producing vital human resources for the region and to the production of knowledge. Makere is entering a new era, celebrating 100 years of excellent service to humanity and transforming into a research-led university. I am happy to see that CHUS is taking a leading role in this great endeavor. This conference points to the vibrant research that is taking place at CHUS. Congratulations. With funding from government for research through RIF, there is more research, and I'm confident that CHUS will research more on our indigenous knowledge and values as our visitor and the president of the country has urged us for a very long time. The revitalized research and the publication culture at CHUS is commendable and I thank the leadership and staff of the college. Let me join the principal in thanking the government and our development partners, particularly the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Gerda Stifting for the enormous support. I want to thank the council, which has guided the university very well and especially at this crucial time, as we celebrate 100 years and transform into a research-led university for the main purpose of becoming more responsive to the challenges that face the development of our country, our region, and humanity. I have no doubt that Jews and the humanities are going to play a very important role in finding solutions for all the challenges that face us, including climate change, health, food security, and unemployment, which are some of the major challenges that face our country and our region. Makere, proud, Makere University is proud of what is is doing, all I can do 
or all I can say at the moment is to urge you on to research even more, to publish even more. And I must take this opportunity once again to congratulate you for revising or revitalizing the Mawazo Journal. This is the way to go. It is journals like Mawazo that are going to enable us to meaningfully research and publish on issues that affect us. Let me take this opportunity to thank the college and the organizers for organizing this conference. I have looked at the abstracts and I'm truly elated that we are producing such high level papers at Macquarie University. I once again congratulate you, the principal and all your team on this enormous achievement. I wish everybody an enjoyable conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, our dear Vice Chancellor. Yes, to all of us, we've listened to the Vice Chancellor. We've listened to the Principal College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And a key word from the Principal, Professor Josephine Ahikile said, that hosting the 2021 Humanities Conference is a demonstration of human resilience. And to remind everyone that we are living to the times and in the theme, there's something, the new era. So in line with this, this is virtually hosted. And what I would like to say is that we are tweeting, we are live, and then we are also tweeting on the following pages. One, our hashtag is hash humanities corn 2021. And then if you would like to follow us on Twitter, please, the, the social media team is very active. Follow us on Twitter at the Makere, on the Makere University Twitter page, which is at Makere. On the Makere University College of Humanities and Social Sciences Twitter page, which is at Makere Chus, and on the Makere University Dicts page, which is at Dicts Makere. Vice Chancellor, we thank you so much for those wonderful words of encouragement, words of wisdom, and words of hope. And right now, I'm pleased to request you, Vice Chancellor, to invite our guest of honor, Mrs. Rona Magara, Chairperson, Makere University Council. Our dear Vice Chancellor, Makere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. Dr. Mende, is still online? Yes, uh, yes. Vice... Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Rita. I would like to take this opportunity to invite our chair, person of council, Mrs. Lona Magara, to address the meeting. I think uh, most of the participants know Mrs. Lona Magara as our chairperson of council. And uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, she is guiding the university at this crucial time when we are really changing into a new century where we hope to be even more relevant to our community because we want to be research led, to do more research into the issues that affect our people and also changing the way we have been doing things. So, I would like to say that uh, under the leadership of our chair, the council is playing a pivotal role 
in transforming the university. And we want to thank you, Mrs. Magara, for your leadership. It is now my honor and pleasure to invite you to address the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nawangwe. Our keynote speakers, the Vice Chancellor, United States University, Nairobi, Professor Zeleza Tiambe, the Dean Faculty of Journalism, Uganda Christian University, Professor Monica Chivita. Our hosts, the Vice Chancellor, who has just been on, Makere University, Professor Banabas Nawangwe, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, Professor Umar Kakumba, the Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Finance and Administration, Dr. Josephine Nabkenya, the Principal, College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Associate Professor Josephine Aichire, distinguished faculty members across the various disciplines, all the presenters and panelists, distinguished guests, the conference organizers, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to officiate at the opening of the 2021 Humanities Conference entitled Humanities and Humanistic Social Sciences Scholarship for a New Era. This conference would not have come at a better time when the world is grappling with innumerable challenges, most evident being the complexities that COVID-19 presents. Apart from the development of human resource, a modern university essentially offers society two main products. The first are the tangible outputs of the hard sciences, such as the innovations, new technologies and equipment. And the second are the ideas and knowledge about the society, which underpin the suitability, acceptability, and uptake of the tangible outputs of the hard sciences. Now, this calls for knowledge about the cultures, identities, social realities, and the political economy of society whose peculiarities need to be considered seriously. Over the last several months, we have celebrated various outstanding research outputs and innovations of Makere University in the disciplines of medicine, crop improvement, nanotechnology, and value chain improvement, among others. However, there has been relatively low visibility, and I just want to underscore this, low visibility of research output in the humanities. It is important to note that the pursuit of development is often about improving human related indicators such as education, health, housing, life expectancy, or access to safe water. It is mainly through social science techniques that we can integrate these critical aspects of human development identify gaps and suggest necessary interventions. Social scientists therefore inform the state of the required steps to achieve the desired human development targets. Looking around reveals glaring contradictions which call for a particular kind of humanities and humanistic sciences. Examples of these contradictions include the slow response and sometimes refusal to adhere to the COVID-19 standard operating procedures that are meant to protect us. The other contradiction that is evident is the increasing poverty despite increasing investment. We also see an increasing number of cases of gender-based violence despite several gains made by women's empowerment. We have the increasing cases of functional illiteracy, despite increased access to literary materials. And finally, but definitely not least, the ethnic nationalism in a globalizing world. Now, a University of Makere's profile therefore bears an exceptionally crucial role in aiding society to confront these challenges while building the resilience to respond to future ones. 
Given that these dynamics are constantly in flux, we indeed need a humanities and humanistic social sciences scholarship for a new era. But what do we exactly mean by a humanistic and humanities social sciences scholarship for a new era? What do we mean by scholarship? Allow me to address this from three focal points. One, the role of the intellectual to society. Changes in society raises questions about the role of scholarship and of intellectual to society. I quote a question posed by James H. Mittelman, then university professor of international affairs at American University. He says, in our earliest times, what are the changing roles of intellectuals? What are their responsibilities to society? It is worth noting that Professor Middleton had been to Makere University, initially enrolled as an MA student of African studies in 1967, and then in 1970 as a special tutor in the Department of Political Science. Both was under Professor Ali Mazuri, the subject of this particular article that I've quoted from. To, Middleton, to Middleman, being an intellectual was a calling to the production of new ideas and new knowledge. Now, for us to do so, we need to reflect on our identity and responsibility to the societies we find ourselves in. Father, we need to inter interrogate the kind of knowledge we produce, who it represents, and then its relevance. The second focal point that I would like to focus on is the symbiotic relationship of humanities and sciences. The rise of neoliberal development ideology in Africa saw the increasing prioritization of the sciences over the arts and social sciences. However, society needs both the sciences and the humanities. Artifacts of technology are not context neutral. They have a life, an identity, a culture, all of which are embedded in society. Let me give you an example. Food has a taste, it has identity and a culture of its own. It is not simply about nutrition and health. Knowing this enables our agricultural scientists to innovate nutritionally advantageous food lines, which communities can identify with. Another example is land, which beyond being a factor of production, communicates heritage, belonging, and identity. These examples highlight the symbiotic relationship of the humanities and the sciences. The question is, how can this symbiotic relationship be articulated and by whom? The third, area that I would like to focus on is the relevance and application of humanities scholars output. I stand here today to challenge the humanities scholars to target research and publications relevant and applicable in providing answers for the societal needs and for national development. Looking at the topics of the presentations in this conference, I'm hopeful that this conference will help revitalize and inspire us to assume our rightful positions as humanities scholars in society. In particular, the two keynote speeches, Rethinking the Place of the Humanities and Social Sciences in the Post-COVID-19 Academy by Professor Paul Tiambe Zeleza and Humanities and Social Science Research for the 21st Century, Reclaiming Scholarly Agency, by Professor Monica Chibita will inspire us to rethink the role of the humanities and our agency as humanities scholars in this context. I'm also hopeful that these conversations will not end with this conference, but will become the routine of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. The establishment of research centers and research chairs in the university's strategic plan 2020-2030 by the Makere University Council is to provide space for the growth of new knowledge and ideas. 
Therefore, as the Makere University Council, we welcome this conference and pledge our continued support to the humanities and social sciences in Makere and the nation. In closing, I would like to extend my appreciation to the principal, the deputy principal and all college leadership, past and present, for the good work you're doing amidst the challenges we're experiencing as a university and the country at large. I specifically thank the chair, Dr. Aisha Nachiwala and members of the organizing committee of this conference for putting together such a great menu. On behalf of the University Council, we appreciate your resilience and pledge our continued support. I extend my sincere gratitude to the Andrew Mellon Foundation for supporting Choose in its quest to revitalize academic vibrancy of the university. Furthermore, I would also like to appreciate the Gada Henkel Foundation for supporting research and training for PhD students in the college. I sincerely appreciate the government of Uganda and all the other development partners for the huge investments they are making towards research and academic programs at Makere University especially through the Research and Innovation Fund. As Alia mentioned, CHOOSE is actively engaged with over 60 projects. I appeal to you to focus your research on the development of our beloved country, Uganda. I'm confident that this conference will provide space for creative thinking towards this cause. I thank the Makere management team for creating a conducive environment that enables staff and students to continue to thrive. With these remarks, I now declare the National Humanities Conference 2020 open. I wish you successful deliberations as we build for the future, for God and my country. Thank you so much, Chairperson of Council, Mrs. Rona Magara, for officially opening the 2021 Humanities Conference. We are now open. We need another round of applause. Yes, that's to you all. And then one for the chairperson of council for opening this conference. Another round for the vice chancellor of Makere University. And a fair one for the principal college of humanities and social sciences. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences comprises of a number of schools. We have the School of Women and Gender Studies, the School of Social Sciences, the School of Psychology, the School of Liberal and Performing Arts, and the School of Languages, Literature, and communication. It's not, okay, yes. And Makere University <laughs> Institute of Social Research. That's not a school, but I've been requested to mention it. It's very central, Maiza, Makere University Institute of Social Research. As, as for our program, we have a break for five minutes. This break does not mean that um, those physically present, you leave the room, no? We are going to engage you during this break by having some video clips to remind us about the 2021 National Humanities Conference as we bring on board the next chairperson of the committee. Let's now ensure that we view the video clips for just five minutes, then Okay, just uh, one video clip because of time. And then as we warm up for the chairperson, the chairperson of the next session is Dr. Sauda Namialo, Dean School of Languages, Literature and Communication.
congratulate the College of Humanities for organizing this Humanities Conference, the National Humanities Conference. The College of Humanities and Social Sciences is a pivotal college in our university because it is, if you want, addressing issues that affect people directly. And that's why we call them the human sciences. So for our university, the College of Humanities uh, has been existing for quite some time and making a tremendous contribution to the name of Makere University, to the production of uh, key human resources for this country and the entire region, but also to research that has made Makere the great institution that it is. The humanities are very much part of the history of Makere University. Actually, you can say a big part of the good history of Makere University is, is attributed to the humanities. So if you talk about people like Ali Mazirui and the writers like Urbadiri and others, these are the people who made Makere the great university we are. So the conference is coming at the right time when we are celebrating a century of good service to our country and to our region and to the whole of humanity. So I would say that the conference is very well positioned to reflect on what we have gone through, the contribution we have made as a university to humanity, and looking forward to what our country, our region, and the world should be, and hence addressing those issues learning from history in order to pave the future. And so I call upon all those stakeholders to follow this conference, to listen to the experts, what they say about our current status and where we are leading as a country, as a people, and maybe to contribute also their ideas so that together we can create an atmosphere that is conducive to the well-being of our people. Yes, it's time for the chairperson of this session, Dr. Sauda Namialo, Dean School of Languages, Literature and Communication, College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Makere University. Dr. Sauda Namialo, we welcome you. Thank you, Rita. Okay, and uh, I'm now pleased to invite you to, as the chairperson of the session, and also to invite our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our keynote speakers, Professor Tiambe Azereza and Professor Monica Chibita. The guest of honor, Mrs. Lona Magara, who has just given us a very wonderful speech. The Vice Chancellor for Makere University, Professor Banabas Nawangwe. The Deputy Vice Chancellors of Makere University, principals, deans, heads of departments, staff and students, participants, ladies and gentlemen, allow me uh, to join the previous speakers to welcome you to the College of Humanities and Social Science Conference of 2021. My responsibility this afternoon is simple, is to chair uh, this session and also to introduce our keynote speaker who will be uh, speaking to us on a topic titled Rethinking the Place of Humanities and Social Sciences in the Post-COVID-19. As you are aware, ladies and gentlemen, this pandemic has brought 
about unprecedented experiences that have uh, that will leave an external impact on our lives. Never before have our best day-to-day -day activities been profoundly interrupted. We've seen billions of individuals have been affected together with losses. You are aware how many people, colleagues, we have lost in Macquarie University and globally. We have seen many people already disadvantaged and groups have been pushed to starvation and homeless with zero medical attention. Equally, we have seen growing inequalities, poverty, helplessness, unequal access to resources, incidences of marginalization, struggles and suffering in every society. Our education here in Uganda and world over has seen many challenges and is operating in total chaos. At the same time, there have been also aspiration among institutions and individuals to create better and more meaningful learning spaces for us. Now with these and many other challenges that are facing us, a big question arises. What is the place of humanities and social sciences in the post COVID-19 pandemic? We are honored this afternoon to have a professor, an icon, a person who is well equipped to answer all these questions in the name of Professor Paul Tiambe Zereza. He has a long CV, and if I'm to go through it, I will need an entire day. But in very brief summary, this is the gentleman who is going to be speaking to us. Professor Tiambe Zeleza has been at a dozen universities in six countries on three continents and Caribbean region. He held distinguished academic and administrative positions in Canada and in the United States for 25 years as college principal, center director, department chair, college dean, and academic vice president before taking the position of vice chancellor, president, and professor of the humanities and social science sciences at the, at, at, uh, the United States International University in Nairobi in January 2016. In the early 2000, he worked as a consultant for the Ford and MacArthur Foundation on their initiatives to revitalize a higher education in Africa. His research project on the African academic diaspora conducted for the Carnegie Corporation of New York between 2011 and 12 led to the establishment of the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program in 2013. And it has to date sponsored nearly 400 African born academics in the United States and Canada to work with dozens of universities in six African countries. He was president of the US of African Studies Association in 2000, between 2008 and 2009. The professor we are having today, he has published more than 300 journal articles, book chapters, reviews, short stories, and online essays and authored or edited 28 books, several of which have won international awards. His most recent books include The Transformation of Global Higher Education, 1945 to 2015, which came out in 2016. Another one, the African, uh, Africa and the Destruction of the 21st Century, which came uh, out uh, in 2021. He has presented nearly to 250 keynote addresses, papers, and public lectures 
at leading universities and international conferences in 32 countries and served on editorial boards of more than two dozen journals of book series. He currently serves as the editor-in-chief, chief of the Oxford Bibliographies Online in African Studies. Before I invite him, this is also worth noting that he has received numerous awards from major universities for his scholarship. In July 2013, for example, he was recognized in the New York Times as one of the 43 great immigrants in the United States. In May 2015, he was awarded the honorary doctor of laws at the Dalhousie University for outstanding personal achievement. Similarly, in 2015, he was a fellow at Harvard University and has held position of honorary professor at the University of Cape Town since 2016 and at the Nelson Mandela University since 2019. Currently is a member of the administrative board of the International Association of Universities, Universities, the advisory board of the Alliance for African Partnership, as well as the chair for the advisory council of the Canada Africa Diaspora Fellowship Program also chair of the board of trustees of the Kenyan Education Network and member University of Ghana Council. Ladies and gentlemen, let us put our hands together and welcome Professor Paul Tiambe Zereza to speak to us on the topic titled Rethinking the Place of Humanities and Social Sciences in the Post-COVID-19. You're welcome, Professor to Makere University. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish, of course, uh, I would have been with you there physically, but as the VC said, uh, we have a new normal. So thank you, Namialo Sauda, for that generous introduction. I also want to thank the organizers uh, of the conference, Dr. Josephine Ahikire, who I met many years ago, and it's been wonderful to reunite. Dr. Nakiwala Aisha Sembatia and other members of the organizing committee. I wish also to thank the chairperson of the council, Mrs. Lona Magara, uh, for her wonderful remarks. The vice chancellor, Professor Banabas Nawangwe, uh, who I've had the pleasure of engaging in various uh, forums, and the management team, faculty, staff and students, uh, fellow presenters and participants. And I want to pay special recognition for students who are making presentations or attending this important uh, conference. So my topic is rethinking the place um, and of the humanities and social sciences in the post COVID-19 academy. As a scholar, I've been a card carrying member of the humanities and social sciences since I went to university in the early 1970s. When I became a high ranking administrator as vice president for academic affairs at an American university and currently as vice chancellor in Kenya, overseeing colleges, schools and fields outside my academic specialization and socialization, I've had to place my earlier intellectual affiliations in the broader context of the modern university in which the humanities are increasingly pushed to the bottom, uh, bottom rungs of the slippery higher education totem pole. Rather than despair by the humanities, I've come to appreciate more keenly their indispensability, the powerful synergies between the humanities and other branches of knowledge, the need to facilitate and foster interdisciplinary modes of knowledge production. In this presentation, I'll focus on the continued and critical importance of the humanities in the post-COVID-19 academy. Before the outbreak of COVID-19, the humanities were increasingly regarded in academic, political, and popular discourses as irrelevant affectations compared to the hard disciplines in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. The pandemic seemed to reinforce 
these prejudices as the world desperately sought biomedical treatments in the race for vaccines and economic and social life, including education, transition to online platforms and virtual engagements, thereby accelerating the fourth industrial revolution. Yet, both the pandemic and digitalization have underscored the necessity of the knowledges, skills, and literacies of the humanities. COVID-19 has not been confined to a crisis of physical health. It has also been a mental health crisis and a complex constellation of economic, social, cultural, and political crisis. Understanding the multidimensional nature and differentiated impact of the pandemic, devising effective containment strategies, and envisioning better futures requires the insights, imaginations, and policies informed by the humanities and social sciences. Similarly, the transformations wrought by the fourth industrial revolution are as much technological as they are social. And the rapidly changing jobs of the digitalized economies of the 21st century require the cultivation of technical skills as much as lifelong learning skills that the humanities and social sciences are renowned for. Thus, there is need to develop more integrated and interdisciplinary modes of teaching and learning, research and scholarship, encompassing the humanities, social sciences, STEM, and other domains of the academic enterprise. My presentation is divided into three parts. First, I examine the common critiques and defenses of the humanities. Second, I'll look at the complex and contradictory impact of the pandemic on higher education in general and on the humanities in particular. Finally, I'll suggest possible ways of strengthening the humanities and expanding their footprint in the academy and society through interdisciplinarity. As a student of intellectual history, the history of ideas and knowledge producing institutions, I believe we need to avoid freezing and flattening the humanities as homogeneous. Rather, we should see them as capacious and changing fields of intellectual inquiry, methods, practices, interests, literacies, and dispositions. It is this very porousness, expansiveness, and malleability that will, I propose, ensure the survival of the humanities in the academy and for society. In defense of the humanities, in many countries and universities across Africa and around the world, the humanities are deemed to be in crisis as they face a barrage of epistemic and ideological assaults from politicians, business people, the general public, and in their own institutions uh, from administrators and fellow academics among the valori more valorized scientific, professional, and pragmatic disciplines. The critiques of the humanities often center on their purported lack of usefulness and apparent inability to offer employability skills to their graduates. The first, that is the critics, in a neoliberal world that valorizes economic productivity, competitiveness, and instrumentality. It is sometimes asserted that reinforcing the apparent decline and disintegration of the humanities in the global post-colonial academy are the intertwined external and internal deconstructive assaults of globalization, decoloniality, feminism, and other insurgent paradigms. It is true, every humanities discipline has been forced to reckon with its Eurocentric and androcentric complicities, its cognitive violence and erasures of subjugated cultures, societies, and genders and their knowledges. All too often, the vicious internal civil wars in the humanities, the fierce battles over terms of discourse, serve to accelerate their marginalization among university functionaries preoccupied with financial exigencies and vocational fields that are late comers to the academy or suffer from serious intellectual deficiency syndromes. In much of Africa, the dismissal and devaluation of the humanities is exacerbated by the omniscient and omnipresent discourse of developmentalism. The humanities bear the brunt of the purported failures of African higher education to serve as the locomotive of sustainable development. They are accused of enticing and trapping hapless, clueless, 
or lazy undergraduates in futile and facile soft pursuits, depriving them of the hard skills of the natural sciences and prestigious professions. The marginality of the humanities is evident on many university campuses in their often modest, if not dilapidated, physical accommodations and reproduced in lower remuneration and institutional regard for humanities faculty compared to those of the more esteemed disciplines and profession. Beleaguered humanities faculty and scholars are forced to mount all manner of defenses against their ideological and financial pressures they increasingly face from within and outside the academy. The critiques and defenses often rest on a caricature of the humanities in which the conglomeration of disciplines and interdisciplinary fields in the humanities are stripped of their richness and diversity and collapsed into a distinct formation, a homogeneous singularity of method, approach, purpose, and value. Clearly, the humanities disciplines are not united by a common object of study or single purpose. Yet, we know the humanities and in the architecture of the academy, they are differentiated from the natural sciences, professions, and other branches of knowledge. They share a commitment to secular truth, interpretation, critique, and construction. They are narrative disciplines that freely traverse and incorporate artifacts, texts, and data, and address questions about any aspect of the human experience using a diversity of methodologies. The defenders of the humanities come in many shades and colors. The affronted uh, absolutists claim the humanities hold the canons of eternal truths about humanity. The functionalists contend that the humanities cultivate enlightened and democratic citizenship. The existential argument emphasizes that the humanities foster habits of critique and interpretation essential for maintaining enduring traditions and heritage in a turbulent world. The pragmatists see the humanities as eminently practical, essential to understanding and functioning intelligently and effectively in an increasingly globalized world. To quote one author, quote, courses in history, literature, religion, languages, art history, and philosophy provide practical handbooks for how to navigate the world. What questions to ask? what themes to look for, what particular patterns of behavior or thought might reveal. This is the call of the humanities offensive. Scientific data alone does not inform and cannot explain all actions and decisions. The humanities provide vital tools for navigating our globalized world." End of quote. Many uh, defenders of the humanities stress the dispositions the humanities inculcate. They include rigorous, critical, and empathetic thinking. The ability to immerse ourselves and invest in appreciating and understanding the otherness and human affinities of different times and places, cultures, and societies. At their best, it is often contended the humanities facilitate historicized reasoning, fidelity to truth and accuracy, they foster intellectual curiosity, nurture the moral imagination, and deepen one's discernment, interpretation, and judgment. While not peculiar to the humanities, these skills are seen as quintessential in the humanities. When I was dean of a liberal arts college in Los Angeles, I was paid, of course, to defend the liberal arts that in our institutional configuration incorporated the humanities and social sciences uh, disciplines and numerous interdisciplinary centers and institutes. In one dean's convocation on cultivating academic excellence, the power and promise of the liberal arts, um, I mounted a vigorous defense of the liberal arts that of course pleased my colleagues in the college and alerted others in the university to our centrality. I pointed out that the liberal arts are price priceless repositories of intrinsic, intellectual, instrumental, and idealistic values, skills, and competences. The intrinsic values of a liberal arts education lie in the sheer joy of learning for its own sake. Asking the big questions, making discoveries, cultivating a lifelong quest 
quest for learning, developing passionate individuals and passionate learners. The liberal arts explore and engage the, prof uh, the profound issues facing humanity. Our indi enduring individual and collective searches for meaning and belonging, the moral, metaphysical, and material dimensions of our existence. They enable us to gain a deep understanding of ourselves and our natural and social worlds. Nurture the pleasures and leisures of contemplation and imag imagination. Evoke and deepen curiosity and wonder. Give us a humane and passionate grammar of life and living in an often inhumane and superficial world. The intellectual value of the liberal arts is embodied in their capaciousness and versatility, the content richness, the treasures of knowledge in the various liberal arts disciplines and ever mutating interdisciplinary formations. Students are exposed to different fields, foci and methodologies in the humanities, social sciences and natural sciences to vast repertoires of human thought, creativity, and invention that are both enlightening and liberating. They develop active and engaged intellects that can be broadened and nourished by the illuminating insights and transgressive interrogations of interdisciplinarity. The liberal arts also have instrumental value. They cultivate invaluable skills and competences for the world of work, including critical thinking, oral and, and written communication skills, problem solving and creative sensibilities. They foster breadth and adaptability to context, as well as sensitivity to human difference and commonality. When done well, the liberal arts provide interdisciplinary literacy, the ability to see phenomena and solve problems for, from multiple disciplinary or analytical angles. Intercultural literacy, the ability to understand and navigate different cultural and social realities and relationships. International literacy, the capacity to understand the complex interconnectedness of the world's nations, economies, societies, ecologies, and challenges. And information literacy, the ability to locate, evaluate, and use information, which continues to explode exponentially effectively. This is particularly critical in our age of fake news and massive disinformation perpetrated by politicians, bloggers, and ordinary people that is spread with the ease of a click on social media platforms and by internet bots. Finally, the liberal arts have idealistic value in their vital contribution to the development of character and citizenship. They can deepen and expand students' sensibilities and emotional richness, ethical reasoning, and capacity for empathy. The moral power of empathy lies in the ability to recognize and respect and have concern and compassion for others as fellow human beings and citizens, regardless of the differences of ethnicity, nationality, race, class, gender, religion, sexuality, and other social markers. The liberal arts often cultivate students' moral and narrative imaginations and civic engagement, so critical for informed and responsible citizenship and leadership for building sustainable democratic societies. Through the liberal arts, we can develop the capacity to commit to something greater than ourselves as individuals or the narrow affiliations of ethnicity or nationality as we grasp the complexities and connectedness of the human condition. This is simultaneously humbling and affirming out of which both gratitude and wisdom can grow. Students can learn the languages of ethical responsibility and possibility. There is no doubt that the world needs technically skilled professionals and workers, but there may be an even, and I quote, greater need for liberally educated citizens and human beings who can distinguish between good from evil, justice from injustice, what is noble and beautiful from what is base and degrading, end of quote. Technological progress without ethical values produces the grotesque barbarisms that littered the 20th century and bedevil the 21st century, the most 
technologically advanced centuries in history. The disruptions of the pandemic and the humanities. As I noted in a recent presentation on higher education in a post COVID-19 world, challenges and opportunities for African universities. The outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in early 2020 forced universities around the world to confront unprecedented challenges that simultaneously exposed and exacerbated existing deficiencies, dysfunctions, and inequalities among and within countries, institutions, and university stakeholders. Six stand out. First, in terms of transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to remote teaching and learning using online platforms. Second, managing severely strained finances. Third, ensuring the physical and mental health of students, faculty, and staff. Fourth, reopening campuses as safely and as effectively as possible. Fifth, planning for a sustainable post-pandemic future. Sixth, contributing to, to the capacities of uh, government and society in resolving the multiple dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic. Universities in Africa were among the most affected and least able to manage the multi-pronged crisis because of their pre-existing capacity challenges that centered on persistent structural deficiencies in terms of inadequate financial resources and human capital, poor research output and physical and technological infrastructures, and weak leadership and governance, among others. The pandemic not only put pressure on African university finances and operations, but also raised the stakes for research and policy interventions. African investors were expected to undertake biomedical and socioeconomic research to manage the pandemic. As I noted in an article in University World News, summarizing a series of webinars by the Alliance for African Partnership that I moderated between April and July 2020, in which VC Nawangwe participated, some investors produced uh, hygiene products and personal protective equipment, including hand sanitizers, masks, ventilators, epitents for patient isolation, and mobile hospitals, testing kits and robots for delivery of food and medicines to patients. Others undertook research on the epidemiology of the coronavirus and biomedical treatments and the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic, provided advisory services to government, developed software to monitor the pandemic's spread, and sought to raise awareness and provide psychosocial support to their constituents and the wider society. However, most African universities and companies stood on the sidelines as their societies waited for the development of vaccines in the global north, China and India. At best, a few collaborated with, uh, with overseas universities, research establishments and networks and hosted clinical trials. Weak research and drug manufacturing capabilities have made African countries vulnerable to vaccine nationalism in the global north, while democratic deficits have led to the securitization of mitigation measures gravely undermining human rights in several countries. The pandemic reinforced the depreciation of the humanities and social sciences, as focus was placed primarily on the potential contributions of biomedical research and treatments. Yet the pandemic underscored the intricate, complex, and contested connections between science, society, policy, and between disease, health outcomes, and human attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. As the 2021 UNESCO World Science Report that was issued in June this year notes, caught too often in the past, Perspectives from the social sciences and humanities have been overlooked, despite the reality that human behavior and sociological dimensions are key to successful decision making, as demonstrated by the debates on both the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, end of quote. The UNESCO report makes a powerful case about the importance of the humanities and social sciences in navigating and overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic. Court, increasingly, social sciences and the humanities are central to both evidentiary synthesis and brokerage, end of quote. The report stresses that the need to see the scientific or scholarly knowledge enterprise as an ecosystem. As such, it has to be based on 
caught a plurality of scientific input, including from the humanities and social sciences. But it also illustrates the reality that decision-making ultimately depends on a range of values-based judgments by politicians, end of quote. One could add attitudes to the infection and vaccination go beyond the efficacy of biomedical research and reflect complex, contradictory, and changing individual and social attitudes. As Mrs. Magara noted earlier, the sciences and humanities have a symbiotic relationship. The pandemic has accelerated the fourth industrial revolution, marked by the emergence of quantum computing, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, machine learning, data analytics, big data, robotics, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and the convergence of the digital, biological, and physical domains of life, and the digitalization of communication, connectivity, and surveillance. Various consultancy firms and others have produced numerous reports about the implications of these developments on the nature and future of jobs. It is well understood that the current generation of young people who not only have multiple jobs, but multiple careers, and will spend their working lives over the next four decades in jobs that are yet to be invented. The reports by the World Economic Forum, Ernest and Young, McKinsey, just to mention a few, clearly show that in addition to technical competences and content knowledges, soft skills and lifelong learning skills will become even more crucial. That future is already here. In its Future of Jobs report, published in October uh, last year, the World Economic Forum estimates, I quote, that by 2025, 85 million jobs may be displaced by a shift in the division of labor between humans and machines, while 97 million new roles may emerge that are more adapted to the new division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms across the 15 industries and 26 economies covered by the report. The essential employability skills include communication skills, critical thinking and problem solving, creativity, numeracy, information management, encompassing gathering and managing information, interpersonal skills, including teamwork and relationship management, and such special personal attributes as demonstrating personal responsibility, adaptability, flexibility, and resilience. These are the quintessential liberal arts values and skills. The skills students get from the social sciences and humanities. When I talk to employers, I often hear them say that they can teach their new employees occupational skills, not the ability to write clearly, concisely, and persuasively to speak articulately and logically, review evidence and find solutions, make rational arguments and ask probing questions, and understand context and anticipate outcomes. They appreciate employees with broader cultural horizons who embrace diversity and can thrive in multicultural environments, who are exposed to the world, receptive to new ideas, have a willingness to learn, capacity to synthesize, vast amounts of information and knowledge and can make informed decisions. Thus, the humanities are critical for the jobs and careers of the 21st century, for meaningful lives and fulfilling livelihoods. Finally, revitalizing the humanities through interdisciplinarity. In order for the liberal arts or humanities disciplines, humanities and social science disciplines to realize their full potential, and effectively fend against the barbarians at the gates. They need to do a much better job of organizing, defending, and marketing themselves. They must address the concerns and interests of contemporary students and society. All too often, humanities faculty and uh, disciplines are trapped in antiquarian disciplinary specializations and try to fiercely defend the antiquated Eurocentric disciplinary architecture of the 19th century. The history of ideas shows that the, uh, massive transformations have taken place since then in the systems of knowledge production, dissemination, and organization, 
determined by the demands and diversities of historical geography and the configurations of prevailing institutional, intellectual, and ideological dynamics. In chapter three of my book, The Transformation of Global Higher Education, 1945 to 2015, that uh, Dr. Sauda uh, mentioned, uh, I discuss the shifts that have occurred in what I call the four cultures of the academy, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and professions. Each has been characterized by three key dynamics. First, the reconfiguration of all disciplines and the emergence of new ones, development of complex interactions among the disciplines and struggles for academic capital. Second, the development of new theoretical, analytical, methodological, and educational trends whose trajectories varied among and within countries and institutions. Third, the growth of the interdisciplinary imperative, which predict uh, predictably has its advocates, antagonists, and ambivalence, and is driven by various social and cognitive motivations. I examine this subject in greater detail in the introductory chapter to my book, The Study of Africa, Volume 1, Disciplinary and Interdisciplinary encounters. To its proponents, interdisciplinarity offers a creative space between disciplines where new questions are asked, new approaches developed, new understandings advanced, and new fields and disciplines emerge. It connects disciplinary insights to address questions that transcend disciplinary boundaries and enhances the problem-solving capacities of scholarship. They stress the disciplines and interdisciplines are complementary and illuminate each other and promote among students higher order thinking and more intellectual maturity. Moreover, more careers and employers require specialized backgrounds that are interdisciplinary. And there is nothing inherently wrong with addressing the relevant issues of the day. Indeed, it is our profound role. Critics of interdisciplinarity see it as a threat to disciplinary boundaries, hierarchies, and rigor. The content, its objectives and modalities are poorly defined and conceptualized insofar as borrowing among disciplines is normal. Further, its pedagogical benefits are doubtful for students lacking strong disciplinary foundations. It offers them fragmentary exposure to bits and pieces of various disciplines and impedes their development of disciplinary competence. The claim, that is the critics, into disciplinary studies programs are typically shallow in substituting intellectual rigor for topical excitement and the costs of these programs are too high. Scholars cross disciplinary lines in response to the rise and fall of specialties and the perceived opportunities, both real and symbolic of academic migration. They are also the emphasis of what some call disciplinary envy, the wish by disciplines or scholars within disciplines to model themselves on, borrow from, or appropriate the terms and vocabulary of more esteemed disciplines and their authorities in the perennial struggles for resources and the reputation of capital in the academy. No less important is the explosion of knowledge and the growing conviction by many scholars and sometimes by administrators interested in closing small departments that the 19th century intellectual division of labor uh, is increasingly becoming obsolete. Each discipline is incapable by itself of explaining the complex and interconnected social, ecological, and physical phenomena and processes that characterize our increasingly globalized world. In my view, the drift towards interdisciplinarity reflects the complexity, chaos, messiness, and indivisibility of real life better than the compartmentalized disciplines do. While advances in knowledge occur in the traditional disciplines, they are even more likely in the intersections, the liminal spaces between the disciplines, in the interdisciplinary fields that often emerge out of disciplinary interpenetration and struggles to overcome gaps and silences in the disciplines. Disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity also tend to display different predispositions. Disciplinarians are more prone to academic ethnocentricity, while interdisciplinarians are more inclined to openness. Disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity have existed 
in dialectical tension and the dynamics of their interaction have continually uh, changed since the emergence of the modern research university in the 19th century. In fact, the disciplines emerged out of meta-disciplines. Most of the disciplines and interdisciplines are new. They had acquired their distinctive institutional and intellectual identities in the course of the 20th century, a process that was driven as much by administrative as by academic imperatives to divide knowledge production and pedagogy into manageable units, each with its own epistemic cultures and communities, foundational projects and commitments, and mechanisms of authorizing new knowledge. Interdisciplines came to be distinguished by their lack of departmentalization, to refer to intellectual activities between disciplines, to various forms of disciplinary transgressions, intersections, borrowings, and collaborations. Predictably, various metaphors have been used to capture the divide between disciplinary and interdisciplinary formations. Geographical metaphors about boundaries are particularly popular. Disciplines are seen as territories, fields, or turf that aspiring interdisciplinarians seek to cross, explore, or even annex and colonize. In the language metaphor, interdisciplinarity entails learning the language of another discipline. It, has a, it is akin to multilingualism and multiculturalism and requires acknowledgement of differences of values, epistemologies, ideologies, habits, teaching styles, meanings of scholarship, uh, methods of argumentation, and notions of truth. In short, it is an act of translation and transculturation. According to the metaphor of marriage, interdisciplinarity is akin to a process of courtship between two distinct and often diverse disciplines that suddenly discover spheres of mutual interest and complementary resources. In this sense, interdisciplinarity emerges out of cooperative exchanges between disciplines that require alterations in the very questions and issues framing the interdisciplinary inquiry and interaction, which result in the production of new fields between and across disciplines. The metaphorical diversity underscores difficulties of conceptualizing and capturing the differences between the two in terms of their organization, objectives, and outcomes. Whatever metaphor is used, disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity are mutually constitutive. The latter entails, indeed requires, the existence of the former. Equally varied are the types of interdisciplinary activities. Like disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity entails a series of different activities, has varied programmatic, paradigmatic and pedagogical dimensions and means different things as an attribute of the work, the scholar and the audience. Five typologies can be distinguished. First, there is what can be termed exploratory interdisciplinarity that involves borrowing ideas and methods from other disciplines, as some people would call this multidisciplinarity. Second, team-based interdisciplinarity in which scholars from different disciplines collaborate to solve a problem or understand, or understand a phenomenon, what can be called cross-disciplinarity. Third, paradigmatic interdisciplinarity that arises out of synthetic theories that operate across discipline, disciplines, such as Marxism, feminism, postmodernism, critical theory, constructivism, environmentalism, or what some people would call transdisciplinarity. Fourth, crossover interdisciplinarity, in which new fields are constituted from overlapping areas of separate disciplines, such as anthropology, social psychology, and psycholinguistics, and the vast new fields in STEM, such as the biological sciences and information technology, from biotechnology, nanotechnology, to data analytics. Finally, free range interdisciplinarity that offers, uh, that refers to people with eclectic interests whose disciplinary homes are hard to fathom. In practice, and for many people, these categories, of course, overlap. Many humanities scholars derive hope in the emergence of the so-called new humanities. They include, and I quote, the digital humanities, environmental humanities, energy humanities, global humanities, urban humanities, food humanities, medical humanities, legal humanities, and public humanities. 
these new alloys, to quote one author, again, quote, emphasize commerce between uh, other disciplines, particularly STEM or professional fields and humanistic ways of thinking. And they are not just adding new intellectual perspectives. A substantial institutional infrastructure has materialized to support them, yielding new programs, journals, book series, conferences, courses, degrees, and most importantly, jobs. All this indicates that the, these new hybrids are not the product of some momentary fad. They are here to stay, end of quote. The time does not allow for much elaboration. To quote the same author again, quote, the digital humanities has cast a sizable footprint in qualitative disciplines like literary studies and history, importing methods from computing, statistics, information science, and demography. While the environmental humanities draw especially on the life sciences, but also on disciplines like geology, economics, and engineering, it looks at the human aspects of environmental issues, particularly climate change, end of quote. For their part, the energy, food, global, and humanities uh, draw on humanistic ways to address major social topics. The energy humanities concentrate on specific resources and emphasizes the way that capitalism and energy shape our culture. The global humanities underscores the patterns of migration of people and the networks around the world through which uh, goods are manufactured and distributed and labor dispersed and the urban humanities focuses on metropoles and the food uh, as well as uh, the global south and the food humanities similarly attends to webs of production and distribution although it might focus more on the cultures attached to food end of quote other fascinating trends include the development uh, of the medical humanities I mentioned a moment ago, and legal humanities. They, include, they underscore the fact that both medicine and law are not just technical pursuits, but are grounded, can benefit from, and their impact can be more fully understood in humanistic frames of analysis. Then there is the emergence of what is called the public humanities, the drive among humanities scholars to go public to speak to public audiences about the pressing issues of the day. Data science is also increasingly casting its spell on the humanities, both as an object of study and a method that builds on longstanding traditions of integrating data in the humanities. The growing trend and pressures for interdisciplinary approaches in the humanities and social sciences require curricular reform and innovation encompassing the development of skill modules that focus on analytical practices and thematic modules that focus on major topics and questions facing society and humanity. It also has implications for faculty recruitment, retooling and retention that could include thematic faculty hiring, training and incentives. As a lifelong humanist, and social scientists, I believe the humanities are alive and well. It's our responsibility to ensure they become even more relevant in addressing questions facing our beloved countries, continent, and world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor uh, Tiambe, for that wonderful keynote address. Uh, it has enlightened us on so many, many, many things, and I find it even very difficult to summarize what you have said. But as a take home on my side, there are many people who criticize humanities and social sciences and label them as useless and unmarketable for our products, I think do so from the point of ignorance. They are not aware of the variable skills which humanities and social sciences offer to the humanity. You mentioned skills of like critical thinking, decision-making skills, communication skills, 
problem solving skills among those. It's only the humanities and social sciences can offer such uh, kind of skills that are needed to move uh, the world forward. I also, as a take home, I note that humanities form the foundation of humanity. So scientific knowledge alone cannot answer all the questions and the challenges which we are going through. I'm happy that you have elaborated all this in detail. And lastly, before I call the last person to give the vote of thanks, you have challenged us that if we are to remain relevant today and tomorrow, we have to revitalize our humanities and social sciences in a way of revising our curricula to ensure that we meet the demands of the current, um, the current challenges which are going on in the world. Mostly we need to embrace interdisciplinary approaches to problems, interdisciplinary mm -hmm. research, if we are to remain relevant today and in the future. We should, as you have encouraged us, to listen to the new demands, to the current challenges, so that we can ably come up with effective and meaningful solutions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the wonderful keynote address. Unfortunately, for, for, for the participants, we are not going to have questions for the Professor, but I'm sure uh, he's going to avail us with his uh, keynote uh, paper so that we can share it on our uh, College of Humanities and Social Science website for all of us to continue reading it and internalizing it and uh, working through it to ensure that uh, we take humanities and social sciences to a higher level. With those few remarks, allow me to invite our own uh, deputy principal, Professor Chikoma, to pass a vote of thanks to our keynote speaker. I must say that the, uh, the handicap that followed immediately after his uh, presentation was really not enough. And I would ask you once again, join me in putting hands together to thank our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, Professor Zelza. Uh, Professor Zelza has really done a very wonderful job his paper has been very provocative. It has also been challenging, but also it has been inspiring. In fact, in a, in a sense, Professor Zelza had something for everyone. He had something for the students. He inspired the students. And I liked it towards the end when he actually said, the humanities are alive and well. Before coming to this conference, of course, um, we have had a number of people asking for the relevance and what do we, what message do we carry for the students or the potential students. But from Professor's presentation, I am sure even the future students are very encouraged that the humanities are alive and well, and they are very defensible, not just live on, on a life support, but they are actually very defensible because they enable multidisciplinarity and disciplinarity, which he ably articulated. I thank you very much, Professor, uh, for honoring our invitation and making the opening ceremony of this conference very lively and very intellectually nourishing. Thank you very much. 
And let me also take this opportunity to thank other uh, presenters of this uh, afternoon. I thank the Vice Chancellor uh, for his good remarks about the college and his encouraging support to the college activities. I also thank the, our Chair of Council who uh, was our guest of honor for opening this conference and also for the generous remarks about humanities, but also gave us some uh, food for thought about the low visibility of our research. And I can assure you, Chair of Council and uh, the Vice Chancellor, that uh, as we have mentioned, humanities have been provoked by uh, what you have said about research, but we have started. And as we have said it in local language, to symbol day, for Professor, what we are saying is that we are on the move and we are not in the reverse gear, but we are moving forward. So thank you all those who have attended online, those who are here physically present, the organizers and everyone for making the first day of the event, the success it has been. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending the session. You're welcome. It is our pleasure. And thank you, too, for chairing the session. It has been so lively. We've learned a lot. God bless you. Um, yes, um, we are coming to the end of the first day of the 2021 Humanities Conference. It has been lovely. That's the word I can use. And my name is uh, Rita Namsango. I'm a member of the organizing committee. And we know that we have day two of the conference tomorrow. And we also have day three of the conference on Friday. To ensure that we are on the same page, Allow me to invite my colleague, who is the MC, Dr. Linda Naklawa. Dr. Linda is a member of the scientific subcommittee, and she's also a member of the organizing committee. I'm inviting Dr. Linda Nakalawa to guide us on how to effectively participate in the 2021 National Humanities Conference tomorrow, that is Thursday, and on Friday. And Dr. Linda Nakala will be the final person, and she will also wrap up. Most welcome, Linda. Thank you so much, Rita. My name is Linda Nakalawa, but my supervisor over here, Dr. Chikoma, believes that I will be a doctor, and I believe it too. So thank you so much. I receive the blessing. Uh, thank you so much, our beloved participants, for staying the course with us through the opening ceremony. Um, everybody has been thanked. And mine is just to give us a few pointers to make tomorrow more comfortable. I would like to apologize to our friends who were not able to log on today. What happened was you needed to have registered for the conference in order to attend the opening ceremony. So a gentle reminder for us for tomorrow is the links to all the sessions are available. If you registered, you were sent a program and you were sent all the links. If you did not register, uh, or if you have friends and, and colleagues and family that have not yet registered, please direct them or send them the link to on the Macquarie University website, the Choose page. They can find all the information about the conference, including links to each and every session. I'll say that again. Each session has its dedicated link. Now, all you, you have to click on that link, but unlike other public Zoom sessions that we might have been engaged in, the difference with this one, for security reasons, you are required to have a Zoom account, not a paid one, but the free account. 
because when you click on that link, it won't automatically bring you into the session. You'll be required to put in your Zoom login details. So please take a moment and remind everybody that you have invited to join us on the conference to open up a Zoom account because they will have to have their valid email and a password that they will need to fill in when they first click on the joining link for each session, all right? All you have to do is to have a Zoom account. For today, you needed to have registered for the conference, okay? But tomorrow, each session will have its own link. Please follow those, but make sure that you have a Zoom account. Uh, the other thing I would like to remind us in the chat, those of us that are online, if you've been following, please fill in the evaluation for this day. There'll be an evaluation for each day. Please, we, we value, we value your feedback because we, like, like my supervisor said, and, and like my principal said, to see good day. So this is not just happening this year. It's going to keep happening and we want to keep getting better and better. So we would love to hear from you. Please spare us. You've given us an afternoon. Um, so we'll ask for two more minutes that you take the time to give us some feedback so that tomorrow can be better than today and the next conference can be even better than this one. Thank you all so much. For those that are in the room, I wish you safe journeys back home. And for those that are online, see you tomorrow. We'll be very excited to have you back. As a college, we have uh, decided that for us to make uh, a difference, for us to uh, increase on the vibrance of the members of staff, as a research-led university, we must create knowledge, we must share knowledge, we must also be able to learn from each other, peer learning. Conferences, seminars, um, symposia are those spaces that allow you to process that knowledge, to share it, and even to mentor uh, young scholars. In the conference, we have all ranges of, of staff. We have senior staff, we have early career, we have students, and we also have staff from sister universities in Uganda, Gulu, Chambogo, and so on. That space cannot be taken for granted. It's a very important space for academic growth. As principal of 